So, uh, and welcome to this uh, uh, webcast on uh, Microsoft negotiation. I'm Henrik Sangberg. And my name is uh, Clara Petersen. And uh, we are very glad that uh, to, to give you today a tour of uh, the, the most recent um, the, the most recent trends in uh, negotiating Microsoft contracts. Uh, as, you, as you know, we, we uh, do assist a lot of clients in, in these kind of negotiations. And we collect both uh, prices, uh, price points, and also uh, the tactics that seems to work in, in these negotiations. So we're going to share with you today some of the most uh, recent, ex recent experiences uh, we have on the field. Uh, this is a time now, because this was the introduction. Yeah. So now, <laughs> a, 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 a novelty here at the webcast, the breakup. It's like on TV2, <laughs> uh, we, we, try to, uh, we try to enhance uh, and improve the, the webcast setup all the time. So, so this was the new thing. Perhaps it needs to go a little faster. I'm not really yeah. sure, uh, but, but we'll try that. Okay, so let's, let's dive into it. Yes. First of all, Microsoft is not just Microsoft. No, there are some uh, several agreements. And even though that this webinar is mainly focusing on EA and uh, Asia uh, negotiation, we just shortly want to, to touch upon the, the different agreement types that Microsoft is offering. Um, so there is the EA agreement, which is a three-year agreement designed for larger organizations. And this is what we, we often see that our clients has have, uh, uh, together with the SE, the server and cloud, en cloud enrollment, where you buy um, cloud infrastructure and server um, products. Uh, then there are some, some smaller uh, types of, of agreements that we don't see as, as often, um, which is the MPSA, uh, which is a more flexible agreement uh, that allows organizations to, to purchase cloud services and software licenses on a, what can say, pay-as-you-go uh, basis, which is very ideal for organizations with a very uh, varying software need. Um, so, and then, then there is the, the CSP, uh, which allows uh, organizations to, to purchase software licenses and, and cloud services directly from Microsoft partners, uh, which is also more flexible than perhaps doing a, an Azure commitment. Um, and the last one is the SPLA, which offer hosted uh, software services and, uh, and applications to the customers. Um, so this is like mainly uh, the the top five agreements that, that Microsoft is offering, where EA and SCE is, is the ones that we see the most and is usually the, the medium to larger uh, client uh, segment that they are uh, yeah. back. Yeah. And it's also there where yeah. we see, I mean, let's keep the SPLA out because SPLA is, is relevant if you, if you basically resell software services that includes Microsoft services. So, so that, that, that is only relevant for a, for a fragment of, of, uh, of our clients at least, but, but uh, uh, the, the enterprise agreement uh, and the, the, the SC, those are also where we usually see the best negotiated prices. Uh, so, yeah. so, so that is typically where, where we see most of our clients uh, live. Yeah, so the other agreement types are more going towards the, the, the list price, where with the enterprise agreement and the SCE is, as you say, Henrik, it's more, not easy, but it's, it's, uh, it's more optimal to negotiate your prices in these agreements. And the lack of flexibility in those two, I mean, you basically commit to uh, a, a, a minimum volume yeah. of, of licenses, but that commitment uh, in exchange for that, you, you can get better prices which is very typical for software products. The more you commit, the better, the better discount you usually get. So, so that's also the logic behind the better prices uh, in those two co as compared to, to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the next two, the MPSA and, and the, the CSP. Yes. Okay, so let's start out by can you negotiate? Is it possible to negotiate? Well, data shows that you can. So, so, so um, yeah, take us through this. Yeah. So on the left side uh, of, the, of the graph uh, with these box plots, you see on the uh, X axis, you see the, the discount, uh, uh, the levels uh, and the discounts. Um, and there you see that the levels, whether you're an A, B, C or D customer, 
Uh, we see very varying discounts yeah. in our clients. So this experience. is based actually on our data points in, yes. in our database. Yeah. On so the E3 license, which is very common in, in many organizations. So as you can see, we have a, a level A customer which have gotten a better discount than a level D. Yeah, so, so the, the worst discount in, uh, in, 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 in level D is actually a worse price than the best price on level A, which yeah. basically says, well, you, they can put you in any of these uh, categories, uh, but there's still a huge room for negotiation yeah. within the category. And of course, as you can see, the levels also say some sort of what's the highest discount you can get, that the higher the level, the higher the discount you, you can get like overall. But, but nonetheless, it is possible to negotiate. And, and I think these data points shows very, very concrete that you actually can negotiate your prices. Exactly. I mean, we, we have this plot as well. We have di different version of this graph uh, that we've shown over the time. But this is a graph that basically shows the, uh, the, the big variance in, an, in another way. Yeah, uh, so this just basically says how arbitrarily uh, Microsoft prices their, their products. So we have the, the contract size uh, and the LSP price. And as you see, even though the contract size is 750 or 800 million uh, Danish crowns, uh, they have gotten some of the same prices as uh, a, a contract size of 450. So, so, so just to sum up, big variance in, uh, in, in pricing. Uh, basically, Microsoft will charge you what, what, what based on your ability to negotiate uh, and how much time you actually spend on negotiating, how stubborn you are, because they will be quite, uh, they will be quite stubborn in, 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 in their negotiation tactics. Yeah, so, so Microsoft is, uh, as you all, uh, have already uh, seen, they are increasing the prices for key products, and that both includes their user license products uh, back in 2022 and the increase on all cloud products announced in January this year. Um, so they are increasing prices for, for very key products and pushing, uh, having an, an aggressive upsell strategy, pushing clients towards the E5 licenses. Um, that they are providing. Um, so, so they are also having this really aggressive upsell strategy uh, where they are pushing both security and uh, the E5 licenses. Yeah, getting clients to, to, to increase their lock-in uh, during the negotiations. Um, and then we have seen that, that Azure growth is not meeting their own expectations. So, so it is increasing the, the Azure commitment and the Azure uh, consumption, but it's not uh, meeting their own expectations, uh, which means that a lot of our clients are reconsidering their, their cloud strategy and investigating alternatives, as uh, Azure is not the, the only uh, player in the market in, in this field. Um, and then the, the last one is that Microsoft is stalling the negotiation, which is a uh, a clear uh, pattern that we are seeing in, in each negotiation, that they are canceling the meetings and then they are not showing up, they are postponing and they are sending the, the wrong um, proposals to our clients, uh, including products they didn't ask for, excluding products, etc. Um, but, but the good thing about this, if there's a good thing about this, is of course that when you get to the deadline, if you have your, I mean, all negotiation, all, all, in many of negotiations you also need to basically uh, insist on some kind of fairness in the negotiation, which is a good thing to start out with. To say, okay, so, so we are willing, to, to, be, um, we are willing to, to go all the way to get a good agreement with you, but, um, but we need to make sure that, that we have time to do uh, the negotiation in a good fashion. And if, we then, if you then end up two weeks before deadline, without a, 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 a reasonable proposal. And you can point out that this is their fault, not your fault. I mean, basically saying, okay, we need to, to escalate, but just for the record, you have been stalling the negotiation these four times. Uh, so we expect you to basically extend the deadline with a similar uh, number of days. Um, th then whether you get it or not, in most situations, you, you do get to, a, to an agreement uh, before deadline because they are very incentivized to do that. 
But basically, that 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 comes back to what it, what's your alternative to basically signing a crappy agreement? That is to not sign a crappy agreement, right? That is to go beyond the deadline, because as we usually say to our clients, the sun will get up the next morning uh, after the deadline expired, and you didn't sign a new agreement. Uh, your Microsoft products will most probably work. <laughs> they will, because Microsoft will not shut you off. They will not punish you very hard. On uh, on not being able to uh, finalize the negotiation on deadline, but makes but don't but don't don't be mistaken, the the, the account manager will be punished for uh, for going uh, beyond the deadline. So 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 that's that's a very strong negotiation lever. That is actually it's their deadline. It's not really your deadline. I mean, as soon as you start asking questions as to is this really compliant? I mean, are you misusing your monopoly? Uh, would you like some bad press on this? Uh, would you like us to basically contact the EU competition authorities? Or I mean, all those kind of things, they will go a long way to avoid that. Mm. Uh, so, so that usually works. So we've seen that as well. Okay, so if you want to succeed in your Microsoft negotiation, these are the six points that you definitely need to have in place. And, and we'll just go through them uh, briefly here, and then we'll talk, we will dive into to, uh, to, to a number of them as, as we go along. First of all, improve your BATNA. The BATNA is the best alternative to the negotiated agreement. So, so what's the alternative? Well, it might not be to replace Microsoft altogether, but it might be that some of the products uh, could be replaced with uh, third-party products. The BATNA is also, you don't sign an agreement right now. You don't sign a three-year agreement right now. I mean, you could switch to other less attractive agreements, but agreements that would also be less attractive to Microsoft. So there's always alternatives, and, and, and the, the most obvious alternative is basically to go beyond the deadline because that is extremely unattractive to Microsoft. The, the difference between them being able to book a three-year deal, which goes directly into the books and, and impacts the, uh, the, 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 the stock price on Wall Street, that is of great value as opposed to not having that agreement. So, so look into your and go to, to your badness and basically long-term reduce your login, make it possible for you to switch at least some of your products with alternative products. Yeah. Then you, you definitely need to understand your usage pattern and optimize your baseline. And that is you, you need to estimate what is the potential from consolidating your service and optimizing your user baseline. Is there any users that we can downgrade without impacting the, the work or the the need of the, uh, the license. Um, is there any service we can consolidate? Um, is there any uh, users that we can simply terminate? Uh, they are inactive. Um, so, an and understanding your users pattern is also how much are you using your license? Uh, and we will dive into this later on as well, um, where it is uh, a great leverage in the uh, negotiation if you understand your own usage of the Microsoft license. Yep. Because it, it is a, a, a leverage you can use where you can say, we, we really want this license, uh, whatever, uh, and, but we don't want to pay the full price because we, we, we can see here by data uh, and back by data that we don't use the full, uh, all the, uh, yeah, the, the things that are included in the license. Yeah, one well-kept secret is that you can negotiate with Microsoft on the pricing of a piece of software based on how much you actually use it how valuable it is to you. So, so an E5 should per probably not cost the same, should not cost the same for all users because some of your users will use it in a very limited way. And, and that's a good negotiation lever, basically to say that some of the licenses, some of the uh, functionalities of the, of, of the products are not, simply not being used and therefore you want a discount based on your limited use. We have seen this in, in, in many clients of ours uh, where they have maybe different schools or whatever, where, uh, where they have a lower price for perhaps the blue-collar workers or some, some workers that are, are having. Uh, 
lower need for, for the, the different functionalities in, in the E5. Number three is basically make sure that, that you know your uh, Azure, your cloud business case, um, and, base, and, and carefully consider your Azure commitment. Uh, the Azure commitment is a prereq for uh, a good uh, discount on your uh, Azure contract, consumption contract. But, but, but the danger lies, of course, in, in, uh, in, in committing too much, more than you would actually use. So, so that is quite important that you do not overcommit. And, and it is possible to get quite reasonable rebates uh, even uh, without uh, having the, the kind of commitment that Microsoft would basically start the negotiation out with. Uh, so so be, be careful there. Yeah. Then you need to know your target zone and define your negotiation strategy. And that is through benchmarking and knowing where do we need to land in this negotiation price-wise. Um, and you have to have your negotiation strategy very clear. Uh, we will go through the negotiation strategy template that we use to prepare for, for negotiations with our clients. Um, and, and how you ensure that you have your BATNA uh, defined and what are the interests of the client and the vendor, etc. Yeah. Start early, uh, even though they will try to, uh, to block or delay or whatever the negotiation will basically, because they, they will do that, start early, allocate sufficient resources, involve your management, uh, make sure that, that the, your alternatives are well-defined, even the long-term alternatives, uh, and make sure that you have a, a, a full understanding within the organization uh, about the, the, the key messages to Microsoft during the negotiation. Microsoft has a very elaborate intelligence service system of, of a lot of people working around your organization, gaining information, I mean, uh, of getting information, talking to your technicians, to uh, people on the business side, making sure they understand your needs, pro sometimes even better than the negotiation team. Uh, so make sure that one, you understand what they do understand, you know what they know, and two, make sure that you close off uh, the, the information flow to Microsoft so that, 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 that there's a control flow of information during the, the negotiation process. It's extremely important if you want to basically have say a number of security products in play in the negotiation with, an, uh, with a third party alternative as, as the lever in the negotiation. Make sure that nobody in your organization gives Microsoft the impression that you already decided to use uh, the Microsoft product. Um, so, so, so that is quite important that you control the flow of information. The last one is that you need to understand Microsoft and their uh, internal escalation paths. Uh, so uh, as we uh, said earlier as well, the, the account manager works with a limited mandate and sometimes you need to escalate internally in Microsoft to get the attractive discounts. And that is maybe you need to, to talk with someone, someone with a higher mandate that can give you the discounts that, uh, that you request. Okay, so the levels. Yeah. What, what are the things you need to, to basically uh, put into the negotiation in some kind of form. Uh, one of them is user profiling. Um, the, you need to divide your users into segments with different use. You need to support this by with data. We'll show you very shortly how you can do that. But basically telling Microsoft that we have this chunk of users, external consultants, blue collar workers in, in, on the factory floor, People are working in uh, in in uh, in in the in the shops or whatever, and they're not really using the product uh, as much as our administrative workers here. So we basically want to uh, a differentiated price. Uh, we want you to basically take into account that we have a number of users with less value from the product. And then you also need to consider: is it is it um, possible to downgrade some of these users? to a less attractive license uh, in, from Microsoft's point of view uh, that you can use as an option that if they really do not move on the price, make sure that you have a scenario where you can downgrade the users. And then you will lose some sort of functionalities um, but, but, and it will be less attractive. Uh, but make sure that, that you have those plans ready when, if Microsoft is not moving. 
Yeah, the important thing here is to say, okay, we could give these uh, an, an, an E3 or F1, whatever. We could give them something else. And even though your, your, your internal IT team says, well, that's really not attractive. That would require us to do a lot of extra work, give them extra functionality in other forms, which is uh, tedious and, and something we do not want. If it's, if it's theoretically possible, then it is, of course, uh, uh, an argument you can put forward in the negotiation to say, instead of our forcing us to use either a non-Microsoft product or a, 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 a smaller Microsoft product, we, we really want to give all these users the E5, and we want you to basically allow us to do that by lowering the price for at least a part of the population. Because it is in Microsoft's interest to give all your users E5. Remember, these are not cars that are built on a factory uh, where the bigger car is more expensive to build than the, than the smaller car. That's not the case. All the, the, all the extra licenses, licenses have has the, the, the same cost, zero, right? So, so for them to give you an E5 is more attractive because it makes you more dependent on Microsoft products long term. So that's why this works. User profiling works in negotiations. Yeah. Then the functional user uh, mapping is that you also need to ensure that you have the right licenses for all your users. Um, and that is, uh, if you map out, are we using all the different functionalities in the, in the licenses? What can we shut down? Um, and how can we license our users in the best possible way with less functionalities that are still working in our organization. Um, so you need to, to make sure that you have these uh, levers in the negotiation where you map out completely, we are using this, this, and this functionalities, but these uh, five functionalities we are not using. Um, yeah, also depending on the price. Yeah, we did touch upon the start yeah. the negotiation early, so I won't say anything more about that. And also, I think we mentioned it is important that you build alternative scenarios and calculate the price of the alternative scenarios. And as well as the third-party product substitutes. Yeah, yeah. We, which is usually what, what you basically put into those. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it, it touched upon the, the last one, which is basically more a, a long-term thing. Make sure that between negotiations uh, that, that you have a close look at the login. Software vendors are becoming more and more aggressive uh, on, on, uh, in, in the negotiation, which means that having real uh, uh, alternatives uh, for substituting ma ma major parts of the software stack is actually quite important in order to, uh, I mean, reducing the login by, by, by having those plans ready. Mm. You could say that every time you put a new product in place, make sure that you consider how difficult it will be to basically replace that product at a later stage and have that plan ready. Yeah. Because that is going to be increasingly important in software negotiations moving forward. So, so this is more of a long-term strategic uh, thinking, way of thinking, rather than the, the short-term negotiation tactics. Okay, on the Azure side, uh, we do have uh, special uh, webcasts on Azure and how to optimize in, in Azure. There will be, uh, by the end of the year, we will have a, a big uh, uh, Azure optimization webcast where we'll go through a number of, of things. But basically, one of the most important thing is the more you use reserved instances in your, in your Azure setup, the more tied you are to Microsoft. Uh, and the less ongoing dynamic optimization uh, uh, opportunities you have. So that's why we say limit the use of reserved instances. Instead, use uh, go to our webcast and see the other tools you can use. Those are right-sizing, uh, dynamic uh, reshuffling of, of, the, um, of the resources to, to newer, more effective resources. And it's using savings plans instead of uh, reserved instances. So go to that webcast and, and, and look at that because that, that's quite important when you go into the negotiation 
that you do not have too much capacity locked up for one or, two or three years. So use uh, saving plans. We say weaponize your FinOps. FinOps is your, your most important process if you have cloud um, in, a, in a volume uh, above 5 million Danish kroner a year. Then you definitely need your FinOps uh, to be in place. And, and always consider the alternative scenarios and, and, have them, and have them ready. Either shifting between the hyperscalers or moving things out of the cloud and back uh, to, uh, to, to your on-prem uh, or private cloud setup. The, the reason why you need to have the scenarios ready is, as we, we talked about earlier, it is because it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful negotiation lever to demonstrate that you can actually move out of your Azure uh, cloud. And, and that's part of, of, of a series of, of what we call counter-login initiatives. I mean, carefully consider when to move from yes to pays because pays gives you a higher login than, than the, the yes parts of, of, of the Azure stack. So, so these are the kind of things where you need to consider when do I move into a, a stronger login position uh, than I am today. Yeah, and then we also see uh an increasing amount of our, our clients having this unified support agreement, which is this uh, special uh, support agreement in making sure that you are the first one to go through support line if you are having any uh, problems with, with Microsoft. Um, and if you are negotiating this type of agreement, you, you need to make sure that you investigate support delivered by a third party alternative. And these exist, uh, it's consultancy agreements as well, uh, that, that you, can, you can investigate. Um, and then you need to measure your actual use of the individual part of the service. And that is that together with the calculator of the real value of the individual elements uh, of the support agreement is that we have seen a lot of um, different examples where, uh, the, where we actually measure the, measure the real value and one ticket is, is way, way, way too expensive uh, comparing to, to third party alternatives. Um, so these are some of the, if you can measure the actual value and, and the real value of the individual elements, um, then this is really important negotiation levels in, in, the, uh, in the negotiation. And then you don't, don't need to extend during the negotiation and wait for a couple of weeks after. Yeah, that, that's, we, we've basically seen that uh, basically most people can live without the unified support. A lot of people are a, a, a bit worried about mm. what will happen if, uh, if, if they do not have unified support. Well, do remember that Microsoft is still obliged to basically answer the phone. Mm. If you're paying 10 millions or 5 millions a year for, for your basic Microsoft products, I think it's reasonable to, ex to expect that they will actually um, give you some kind of support without having to sign the unified support agreement. So, so, so and, and we've seen quite a lot of clients that, that's where, where the unified support agreement negotiation actually didn't yield any acceptable, acceptable result. And, and the, the, the clients uh, decided to, uh, to go at least for, for, for a few months without the, um, uh, the agreement. Some of them never came back, mm. which, yeah. which I think has been a uh, aha experience for Microsoft because when Microsoft came back uh, a year later uh, with a new uh, proposed uh, unified support contract, it was on a completely different level yeah. because the client actually demonstrated we could live without it. Um, so, um, yeah. And the last one is that you need to insist that the value and the price should be detached from consumption. Like mm. it, it makes no, no sense that uh, if you are doubling your Azure consumption or times seven or whatever, that the unified support agreement should grow uh, with the, uh, the increased consumption. Oh, that, 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 the logic there is, is impossible to see. Yeah. So, so uh, and, and we've seen clients where uh, with a, uh, where uh, yeah the, the, the Azure consumption uh, quadrupled or something like that and and uh, they had a three or four times increase of, of the unified support agreement which made it completely yeah. I mean th there was no no uh, value that could could ever justify that amount 
And, and, and that's why you need to insist that if you have a, a unified uh, support agreement that actually basically works for you and you believe there's, there's good value for the money, uh, make sure you, it doesn't increase with increased consumption. And I think this one actually goes very well with the calculation of the real value of the individual elements. Okay, so time for a break. <laughs> So let's take a short trip uh, on, uh, on, on the price increases that we've seen. Yeah. So uh, you, the, the one of you that are facing a, an upcoming Microsoft uh, agreement renewal uh, will face an expected steep price increase. And that is that enterprise customers will face an, an aggregated price increase between 20 and 36% due to both user price increases and the currency harmonization. And we have seen uh, during the last year uh, in our clients that in best case negotiation scenarios, you can actually make that go away and keep your price constant. Um, we, have seen, we have seen examples of, of uh, prices going down on selected, very yeah. few selected pr uh, products. Yeah. So, so but, but, uh, but really, uh, yeah, the best case scenario is that you keep prices more or less constant. Yeah. Um, and based on our experience, yeah, as you also said, Microsoft do not offer significant price reductions for existing products, but we have seen uh, increasing price reductions for the user licenses, especially mm. where the price increases have been uh, yeah, present. Um, and that upgrades can be negotiated with significant discounts. Mm. And that is, for example, if you, we had a, a very good client where we chose to, to have a mix scenario where we have a, an E3, which was the, the license that they actually wanted. And then they chose to upgrade some of the licenses to an E5. Um, and there we, we saw very significant discounts because the client made uh, an, in, an increase in login uh, implementing these E5, but also having the, the rest of the licenses as the E3, uh, where we saw significant discounts on both licenses. Right. So. So basically, uh, th there are still a number of areas where you can work. You can work on the, your Azure discount uh, that you can basically improve uh, from where you are today. Um, but, 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 but for a lot of the, the enterprise agreement uh, uh, elements, yeah, the best you can, you can hope for is basically uh, a, a, a status quo on, on the pricing right now. Yeah. So, so that's important, but, but you will be the first uh, three of us. <laughs> yeah, the, the the first three proposals uh, will be uh, basically uh, with a with a steep price increase. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just uh, as an example, before negotiation, uh, we have that the effect from the price increases in both the the uh, the currency harmonization and the user uh, licenses with price increases that uh, a CSP with a monthly commitment. Um, license through a CSP uh, compared to the same licenses through an uh, NCE in April 23 with the price increases uh, had an effect of plus 48 percent before negotiation. Um, and in the EA likewise, uh, the January 22 uh, prices comparing with the, what is it, April 23 prices uh, had an increase of 23 percent, which is mainly due to the uh, price increase on the E3, E1, etc., where Microsoft is uh, very uh, aggressively pushing our clients towards the E5. License. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, there are a number of uh, funny details on that. I think we'll get back to that later uh, on on how you can utilize that. But mm. be, because obviously, what Microsoft would like you to do is to have E5 for all your users. And it's, I mean, it, it's many years ago where they, they had the entire central government uh, move to E5, but made a special E5 for police officers and soldiers, just as examples of, of profiling users with a very low use of, of, of the license. So, so they actually institutionalized, uh, they made special SKUs with, with lower prices on those E5s because it is of Microsoft's interest that all their clients use E5 as much as possible. But you can actually get uh, your discounts 
by just buying some E5s. So, so that's, that's an important, uh, important lessons learned during the last few months. Um, I think we'll go through the next few slides uh, a little fast. They will be uh, in, in the deck if, if you, um, if, that you can get by responding to the mail you'll get after the, the, the webcast here. Um, one of the things you can do is, of course, to have longer period contracts. I mean, having a three-year contract with a two-year extension option uh, and, and a price lock or at least a, a guaranteed maximum price increase at the yeah. end. Which will increase your, uh, which will improve your negotiation position uh, after the three-year period. So, 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 um, so consider these options during the negotiation and see what you can get in exchange. Because obviously, a five-year contract uh, is of value to Microsoft uh, because it, it's basically just more money uh, that they can lock. More uh, committed money. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that's that's one thing. Okay, on Azure consumption, I think it's important to notice that you might have a fluctuating uh, Azure consumption uh, as of now and, and looking back, but this is one of the, the situation where, you know, driving the car by looking in the, in the rear mirror is a very dangerous uh, strategy here. Make sure you have a good uh, outlook for, uh, for your Azure consumption moving forward. A lot of you will have an increased uh, and expected increased uh, consumption. This client actually had a decrease, uh, it's expected decrease in consumption due to the move, the offload of, of, of uh, capacity to Oracle Cloud. So, 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 the, so it's important to have a realistic view of, of the spend in the period moving forward before committing anything. Yeah, so you need to understand your asset consumption and the predictive predicted Azure consumption in the next contracted period uh, before the negotiation. Here's a good graph to show Microsoft. It's a graph that comes out of uh, quarterly analytics. Quarterly analytics is our subscription service where you can get a number of unit prices for outsourced uh, ITO services and our famous cloud report. The cloud report basically have five archetypes, five systems that where we've collected information from, from, from clients on, on these applications. And then every quarter we run them through our benchmark model and, uh, and, and through a model utilizing uh, the, the updated pricing from Azure, uh, AWS, and Google. And, and it basically shows that if you have archetype one, for example, the black bar shows you the price if you outsource the operation to a outsourcer like Kindrel or Avon or uh, Atea or whoever. So, so that's basically the, the basic outsourcing price. If you take the same load and put it in the cloud, uh, you, you, you can see the, the updated pricing on that, the updated cost on that. And this shows you that basically everything gets more expensive if it's on Windows. So that, that basically tells you you need to do the dynamic optimization, you need to do the FinOps, in order to press these bars down. Because if you just move a load one-to-one -one without any optimization, without any savings plans, without any uh, reserved instances, God forbid, or, or any other, uh, other things you, you need to do in order to lower the price, well, it be, will become more expensive. This, one, this graph is important to demonstrate that an 11% price increase for Asia really makes this worse and it will makes it worse for Microsoft compared to a, a number of, of the alternatives uh, in, uh, in, 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 in most cases. So you can see that uh, the Azure plus 11% will make Microsoft more expensive than all of the alternatives uh, in, in archetype one, two, and three, and it will make it basically almost as expensive as, uh, as AWS in archetype four and five. This is the argument that, that the 11% price increase is unacceptable. It basically makes Microsoft non-competable. Com I mean, competitive. competitive, that's yeah. the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot, number of new terms for, for cloud products. Uh, that actually poses a significant risk for you. 
uh, you need to take them into the uh, into to consideration as well in in when you are negotiating. I mean, basically when you are defining your strategy, but also when you are negotiating. And then you need to recalculate the business case and analyze the sensitivity of price uh, of the price increases that Microsoft have announced. Um, and this is just some some examples. Uh, where we see uh, Azure compared to AWS and Google, uh, where the Azure uh, baseline or business case actually ends up being uh, higher than the AWS on a three-year uh, basis. Um, and that's even though that the, the baseline is, is more expensive on the AWS, but ends on a, on a three-year period being more competitive than, than Asia. So remember to to optimize and, and look into the different business cases, which is also, uh, as we said in the beginning, one of the important levers that you use in the negotiation, where you have these, you have very clearly defined what is the business case and what alternative ways can you go in the negotiation. And then... Yep, small commercial. Uh, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well yes. to stay updated on everything important yep. on Microsoft and other yep. benchmarking areas. And you can also find all our old webcasts on our YouTube channel just for, yeah, if you are having some free time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Microsoft is, is, as we also said in the beginning, really aggressively pushing the E5 license and also Power Platform products, Unified Support, Security products, Copilot is the new thing, um, more than ever. Um, and this we, we basically see due to the price increases and the user licenses that are not E5 uh, and that power tools are becoming increasingly important for Microsoft. Uh, and we see that clients implement uh, the power tools, the E5, and imp increase their login. Um, yeah. Which is just talking into this aggressively pushing of, of the upsell strategy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm I'm laughing. Uh, I just uh, I just see uh, in the chat uh, that uh, we have. Uh, I th I think this must be a quote from uh, the Microsoft yearly report or something like that. We delivered record results in fiscal year uh, 2022. We reported. Uh, one, 198 billion in revenue, 83 billion in operating income, and the Microsoft Cloud surpassed 100 billion in annualized revenue for the first time. Yeah. So, negotiating hard with these guys, don't feel sorry about yeah. doing it. They will survive. <laughs> thank you for thank you for that uh, in the chat. So that was good. They're pushing new products. Um, and, and this is, uh, going back to the initial question, this is a negotiation lever because they really need, I mean, to, to continue this growth they're on to basically satisfy Wall Street and the expectations everybody has to Microsoft, they cannot stay still. They, they will have to basically make you want to use more. Um, so if you are on E3, moving to E5 is a priority for them. If you are going to do that, make sure you get paid in, in good discounts and reasonable terms and conditions. If you are considering moving into power tools, if you want to use, continue to use unified support, make sure that this is going to be part of the, uh, the negotiation. And, and make sure that you understand that there are alternatives. Yeah. So this is, this is really just us laying out some of alternatives to what we just saw, that BI, Microsoft have these strategic pro products such as BI, low-code applications and cloud uh, security and the artificial tools, uh, artificial intelligence tools that they are really pushing now. Um, and, and they can make it sound like that they are the only one offering these exceptional good products. But the, the, the real uh, thing is that there are alternatives on the market um, and graded alternatives that is really important during the negotiation that you estimate the future need for a strategically relevant products and make sure you calculate the business case if you are going to switch to alternatives. But also, I mean, if, if you choose to, to go on co-pilot, mm. th that, that is of value in the... Uh, make no mistake, you are giving them a gift. This, the, the, the whole AI space 
is is up for grabs right now. It's not given that Microsoft will will. Uh, it's not it is not a given that the copilot will will succeed and be a, an important part of everybody's desktop and and uh, and and will be the go-to AI tool. So so that's not a given. So if you commit to copilot, you're giving Microsoft a gift. Uh, if you b go further and actually uh, volunteer as, as a reference client or something like that, it's worth even more. We don't say that you have to do this to get good pricing, but that, that is one negotiation lever. Just make sure that you don't get into a login position. So if you go for Copilot, if you go for Power App, if you go for Power BI, make sure that you have your alternative plan ready so you're not in a complete login situation next time you negotiate. This doesn't mean that it, it, it doesn't need to be free to get out of the Microsoft product and into another product. It's okay if, if there's a budget of uh, some million Danish kroner to do that, as long as you can make a business case to Microsoft uh, in, in the next negotiation to demonstrate we, cannot, we, we are actually able to get out here. Yeah, Copilot will create the worst login for customers I agree that that is a real threat. Um, um, so, so consider carefully how you're going to use it. What I'm saying is, if you're using it, even in a, in a limited area, even in a place where you try to and success, successfully uh, increase the, logins, uh, the login risk, it will have value in the negotiation. So Klaus, I completely agree uh, with you on, 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 on the, uh, yeah. The, the dire straits ahead, uh, basically, yeah. Yeah, and then you need to be aware of the bundling. And this, we have talked over it uh, a, couple of, a couple of times during this webcast. Um, but make sure that you are aware of the bundling strategy. And it, it is a strategy having an E3 and an E5 licenses and perhaps an E7 yeah. <laughs> very soon. Or um, nine. Or nine. Um, when starting to use the, the functionality, because it is a, a great strategy from Microsoft to have these bundles that increases the login from the from the clients so that it's becoming more and more hard to get out of these bundles and downgrade the licenses. Yeah. And 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 what you see there is also I mean M3 uh, sorry the the E3 plus the E5 security that's a, an in between scenario yeah. that you could consider so it's just to say yeah. Because it, it will be, in, in some situations, cheaper than the E5. Uh, so so that, that is a, a not-so-attractive alternative for Microsoft. Yeah. 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 And this actually says, speaks very well into what you just mentioned, Henry, that the actual value of upgrading, you need to, to assess the real value, uh, whether you are upgrading to the full E5 license or whether you are doing it in, in bits. So, so if we see here on, on the right side, the weighted average of the unit prices, we have the current license of the E5. And this is just pure examples, but with alternative licenses like the E3, uh, the E5 security and, and some Power BI uh, licenses, Power BI Pro, which is actually more expensive than just purchasing the E5. This is also a, a very known strategy from Microsoft that if you are purchasing it in bits, it, it will be more expensive. This is like when you when you want the burger and the fries and the <laughs> yeah. and the, soda and, the, and, the and the coke and the coke. It will be more expensive buying it in bits than buying the menu. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. same strategy. Uh, I I think I think uh, we are we are running a little out of time. Yeah. It's not our fault. It's all the good questions. So yeah. so so I believe this is the one that yeah. I really uh, been wanting to, to to get to. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, uh, some a distribution of, of white color, blue color, and external uh, users uh, in an organization that, that will help uh, one of our clients. Yeah, this, this speaks back to the to the profiling of, profiling user, of the user and how you can actually do it. So, so what did we actually do here? Yeah. So what we saw is that uh, the blue color and the external workers, we saw that they had very very limited activities based on emails, meeting invites, uh, use of office apps, etc. Uh, which really speaks into that you could possibly downgrade these uh, users to either an F3 or you want a higher discount on, on the uh, E3 or E5 license if you want to continue license these uh, users with that license. Yeah, what, what we are measuring here is really the number of 
I think number of emails sent or received. E- emails all sent, received, uh, meetings interacted in, uh, usage of the Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all these uh, activities that you are using uh, yeah. when you have an, a license. So what you can see is that the, the first bar in each of the histograms is, is, uh, is the zero to 100 interactions with Microsoft systems within a month. Within a month, yeah. B- which basically says that, that if you are there, you are basically using your stuff less than uh, around three times a day or less. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, when you look at the service account, the external users and the blue color uh, users, you can see they have a very limited use. It's actually only the white color users where you see the histogram actually moving moving out to the uh, towards the right, where you have a, a, a lot of users. If I exactly. m- remove myself, you can see you you actually there have quite a significant number of heavy users, uh, yeah. but but you have, you don't have that similar. Uh, on the on on the others, making this kind of statistics backed by data. That, I think that's the real thing. Yeah, like we back these by data. This is Microsoft's own data, and they can probably see it as well. Yeah, as you can. So uh, putting this on the table, coming back to Esben's questions, putting this on the table is quite powerful because it basically says that we have uh, around one third of our users in this situation that has a limited use of 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 the of the product. And, and say all these uh, users have an E3 license. It is a very uh, realistic scenario that you could downgrade the blue, blue color workers to an F3 license. The funny thing is we've just done this in a financial services company here in the Nordics. Um, and, and you wouldn't expect to find blue color workers in, uh, in, in, a, in a company like that. But you did find, we did actually find a Big groups of users with very limited use of the Microsoft very, very products. Very similar to blue color workers. Exactly. Yeah. And also the external consultants uh, and and uh, those kind of uh, of of uh, uh, of users uh, showed the, uh, very low usage. Yeah. So um, the the other thing is a thing. This is this is an oldie but goodie. Uh, something you. We we preached this for the last uh, 13 years. I mean, do make sure that you have optimized your uh, licenses on your servers. This is tedious work, but it's extremely important to make sure that you only license the number. I mean, that you have your software on machines with with the number of CPUs that you actually need. And that you only license so many CPUs as, as you actually need. So, so right sizing uh, and, and uh, incre- I mean, have the right uh, utilization is, is, as always, a very important thing. And a breaker? We need a breaker, I think. Now to the thing that, that stands close to our heart. Close to our heart, but with only nine minutes left. Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so about, ne- about negotiating these contracts. And defining your negotiation strategy before you enter the negotiation with Microsoft. Okay, I'll take this very briefly and then, then we move on. Yeah. Start early, we've t- talked about that. Keep management informed. Very important, make sure every duck is in a row when you do this. Keep the ball in play, this will take time. Um, and know that best and final is neither best nor final. Uh, I think we've been uh, in negotiation where we had best and final 5.0 uh, and, 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 and uh, negotiating about that as well. This is the final best and final. This is final <laughs> best and final, very, very final. Yeah. Um, so control the flow of information. And, and this is basically about making sure that, that you start out uh, um, by saying, okay, what's our key messages to Microsoft? Write them down, make cue cards to upper management. So when they're called, because they will, uh, at some point in time, there's, there's a chance that, that uh, people high in your organization will be contacted through networks or other means by, uh, by Microsoft uh, executives. Make sure they know what to say. Communicate internally, stop sharing project plans and so on with Microsoft during the negotiation and basically carefully consider what to share with any Microsoft reseller. Um, yep. 
Yeah. The, I, I think I'll skip through yeah. this and just say, these are the typical vendor interests. These are the typical interest driving vendor behavior. Make sure you understand them. These are the typical interests you might have. Go through the list and tick off those interests that are most important in your current uh, negotiation. So is it lowest price? Price Is it basically uh, portfolio optimization or transparent uh, agreement or whatever? And this is, yeah. This is just an example of, of how we define the negotiation strategy following a, a, a very basic, not a basic, but very like gen general template uh, where you define the scope, the target zone, the interest both from, from your point of view, but also the Microsoft account manager, Microsoft as a company. Uh, make sure, as, as we also mentioned, that you have your BATMA in place. What's your walkaway criteria and what are the options that you can pull in the negotiation uh, during uh, the, the negotiation where you, where you have these options? How, how can we use them and make sure that you have the, those laid out? This is really the way to, to, to negotiate uh, with Microsoft. That is to make sure on the left side that, that you have your analysis ready. Uh, that you know what you're going to negotiate. Is this an EA, an SC, an ASHA? Is it also a unified support? Mm -hmm. So, so th this is, of course, just an example. Make sure that you understand where it's realistic for you to, to end up. Yeah. This is where we provide benchmarking services, obviously, that can help you understand uh, what is a realistic target zone for your negotiation. Um, and this is, of course, just an example um, that, that we're showing here. And then the BATNA, what can you do in order to, uh, I mean, if you do not get an uh, acceptable agreement, um, uh, what can you do? Well, you could pursue a two-club strategy. You could uh, stop committing uh, any more uh, Azure. Uh, you could uh, negotiate beyond the deadline. You could continue use after expiration. You could basically go for a shorter contract term. This would be more expensive, probably. But it's, it's also very unattractive for Microsoft, which is why it is a bad man. Um, and, and the options, we've been through a lot of the options and negotiation levels to, today. And, and here we have put in some, some examples in, in this concrete example where this client um, is, is, is going for, for profiling, uh, for Teams Premium, for Power Apps. Uh, these are things that we could put into the agreement which would make the agreement attractive to Microsoft as well, but we could also uh, choose not to put them in. Uh, yeah, so, so, so th th this, is, this is an example, and we, we do recommend that every time you go into a negotiation, any negotiation, that you basically fill out this one pager for the negotiation. And for Microsoft, it is extremely important that you have these, uh, these elements uh, defined, well-known, uh, and update it during the negotiation. There's just a new black ninja methods of, of Microsoft in the, uh, in the, in the chat here. Um, price increases will come less. Uh, yeah, there, there's no doubt that Microsoft is weaponizing these negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is no doubt. Uh, so, um, um, and Klaus saying best proposal is on New Year's Eve. That's probably true as well. Uh, and, and just to, to, to understand, it's not getting easier to negotiate with Microsoft. I completely agree with those kind of, of, of notes there. So, so um, not to say that it's impossible, not at all, but it doesn't get any, any easier. And one of the important thing is also to understand the escalation route within Microsoft. Yeah, are you negotiating at the right level? You will start out negotiating with an account manager. At some point, you'll get to the commercial director, typically an industry lead or something like that. But, but uh, for larger contracts, you need to get to, to, to the regional office or EMEA, to, to the business desk to actually get the real, the, the real good deal negotiated. So, so if, if you are, I, I mean, if the entire negotiation is with the, the local office, don't expect that to get, give you the best result. Now for the negotiation uh, roadmap. Yeah, uh, we have, we actually uh, we are are a little out of time. Short of time, yeah. So, so, um, so let's go through this very fast. Yeah. 
so, so we have uh, split our phases into a preparation phase, an analysis phase, and a negotiation phase. And in the, the prepare, where you pre pre prepare yourself for the negotiation the best is where you establish an overview of the bill of material, what kind of licenses do you have, what kind of future needs do you have across all your agreements, and you map your current usage uh, to match the licenses uh, needs to business value. You map your current and projected uh, Azure consumption. What we have basically been touching upon the whole webcast, you identify all your future needs on, on the strategically relevant pro uh, products. And then you go into the an analysis uh, phase where you, you generate the scenarios that you're going to uh, request proposals on from Microsoft. You identify your target zone. Uh, where are you going to to land in the negotiation? What's the benchmark? Uh, what's your BATNA? Uh, you are define your negotiation strategy, and and th these are very important phases to follow very generically when you are preparing yourself for the Microsoft negotiation, because the better prepared you are, both when having a very clear view of what you are currently using and what you are wanting to use within the next three years of your agreement is extremely important because otherwise Microsoft will, will anticipate how you are going to use the licenses the next three years. So having these in, in place before the negotiation begins is extremely relevant uh, and, and creates the best possible outcome of, of your negotiation. And uh, we are not, we are, we are no longer away than 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 your email or telephone. So contact us if if you want to discuss this further. Um, and stay tuned for more webcasts here on uh, the Sangbear channel uh, as we move along. So yeah. thank you for thank from you us. All.